good afternoon, saints. I want you to prepare yourself to be ready to receive a word from God's a word from God's word, guys. I'm I'm excited. I just want to talk about that which the Lord has put on my heart and the things that I see. And I want you to keep me in prayer. Definitely keep me in prayer, saints, that I may stay focused on the moment. There's so much stuff I so many things going through my head and so much life is going on. I'm trying to push all of that out and get about the business of God. So keep me in prayer. And would you please extend me some grace, guys? Extend me some grace. I uh, with a person that have so much going on in his mind. Again, I'm not that pastor, and I'm not knocking any of them. That's a full-time pastor in that. That's their job. That's what they do. No, I have a regular nine to five, and it's um, some heavy lifting um, that goes with it. So dealing with all of that and then the things of life and the things of the day, I may find myself a little times my brain is squirrel brain all over the place, and I'm trying to pull it in. So if you would keep me in your prayers, um, that I may stay focused in on the things that God has given me, for the moment, guys, I will be so thankful. I truly, truly, truly will be thankful. So with that said, let me remove who's in church and who's not in church so I will not be distracted. Just as I ask you, do not be distracted, but stay focused in on the word. Let's not worry about who's not here. I want to thank God for you guys that are here and that we may make ready that the Holy Spirit may feed us in the moment. So with that said, let's go before the throne of grace in prayer. Father, we honor you, we bless you, and we thank you for who you are and for all that you have done. Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord, you have put before us another day that you have made another choice. And we have chosen to rejoice and to be glad in it. But Lord, we just want to tell you thank you. And we bless you once again for this opportunity, Lord. Now, with everything that's going on with our life, with all the things, Lord, life is trying to pull from us, Lord, we have decided to take some time out of our busy schedule just to hear from you. For we know that peace is up under the authority of your word. We know, Lord, that our understanding is up under the authority of your word. We know, Lord God, that the complex complex problems that we face in life is up under the authority of your word. So if we get up under your word, it will give us, Lord, that peace and those problem-solving skills that we need, Lord, in order to deal with life as it comes. So, Lord, I pray that we remove every distraction that the enemy try to put up before us and even the distractions that we set before ourselves. I pray, Lord, that we remove those to the side, that we may take a moment to hear from you. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit may have his way to be able to explain the word of God to thy people, that we may have a better understanding of how to apply it to our lives and then, Lord, live thereby. So, Lord, with that said, by the power, Lord God, and the authority which you have given me, a your word, I right now give the Holy Spirit the power of attorney to this message tonight. Help the saints that they may not find, Lord, this is just routine, that the devil may allow them, Lord, that they have their mind in a dull state that he may steal, Lord God, or take for granted, Lord, that which you have set before us, to be able to be in a country where the word of God can be proclaimed right now and we are, Lord God, not in any way, form or fashion, up under, Lord God, persecution or harassment for proclaiming the word of God. We just want to tell you, thank you, for according to your word, this will not always be. So, Lord, bless us that the moment that we may take it in, Lord, that when those times shall come upon us, that we have the word already in us, that we may apply the word through us Lord, that we may be able to find out what you have for us. So, for the people that are here, help us to stay in the moment, Lord, that we may be ready to receive the word with all readiness, Lord God, just as the Bereans was in the book of Acts. To those that will be joining us shortly, I pray, Father, and plead the blood of Jesus that you may keep their mind focused, that they are able to get to a safe place, that they may pick up the word of God and be able to study with us via that word. And for those that will not be here with us tonight for whatever reason, I plead the blood of Jesus that you are able to, Lord God, reach them at a later date, that they may have a desire in their heart to view the message, follow up on that desire and find out exactly what it is that you have in it for them. Lord, I thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord God, for this moment. We plead the blood of Jesus, giving you the power of eternity, ready to receive thy word. We say thank you, Jesus, for who you are and all that you have done. Father, this prayer, we ask the Holy Spirit to deliver to the Father, for it is both in the name and under the blood of our Lord and our Savior. For you are Jesus. You are the Christ. Now, if you're in agreement with that prayer, saints, signify by saying amen. And again, amen is just saying, I'm in agreement with you. Uh, listen to what was said, and I'm in agreement with you. Now, we are traveling through the book of Acts, guys, and we're coming in on the latter parts of the book of Acts. And we have started on Acts, the 25th chapter. Now, some exciting things that are going on here. And when you look at this, this is not only just God is giving you a biography of one of his servants' life. But it's also how this applies to you and I this day and time because these same things 
that Paul have been facing. It's the same things you see that happen in the world today. And God forbid, you know, it may happen even to you. So it will behoove us to understand God's word and how to apply God's word to our lives. That when these things show up, we'll know exactly how God wants us to behave as servants of heels. So with that said, we're going to touch bases, guys, in our ever-popular slingshot effect. We want to go back to Acts, the 25th chapter, and it was the first five verses that we was able to cover. We'll touch on that, and then we'll go forward with new information. Amen? Amen. So in Acts, the 25th chapter, in verse number one, here's the account. It says, now when Festus was come into the province, after three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And when the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him and desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, lie way in the way to kill him. But Festus answered that, but Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself would depart shortly thither. Let them therefore Say he, which among you are able, go, go down with me and accuse this man if there be any wickedness in him. Now, what we had uh, taking place, and you need to focus in on what was happening. Now, remember, who is this that's talking to Festus? We know according to the word of God right there, it's um, verse number two. It says the high priest. And the chief of the Jews informed, informed him against Paul. Now, these are, quote, religious people. And so we don't ever want you to have the thought just because the person carried a title as a religious person or a pastor or a Christian. Don't think for one moment that they're not prone to get into things or allowing their flesh to take place. For we learn in the word of God that there's a war that's going on. Your flesh is always in battle with the spirit of God. And the spirit of God is always in battle with your flesh. So don't ever think for one minute that your flesh will get saved. You will find nowhere in the Bible from Genesis, the first chapter, to Revelation, the 22nd chapter, you will not find anywhere where your flesh gets saved. For the word of God tells you that your flesh, would, it, it, it depends on what spirit you allow to control your flesh. So that's why the word says we're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. So what God is saying to you is your flesh is just, if you would, your flesh, your body, if you will, is nothing but a house. Now, who are you going to allow to live in that house is going to determine how that house is going to look. You can have a hundred million dollar home, but if you have a person with a, 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 a mentality, a mentality that will not take care of that which they have, you will quickly see that hundred million dollar home go down. Then you can have a person that have a mentality of excellence and you can put them in the worst place, the worst part of town, give them the worst house and it won't take long before they bring that house up. So I'm saying your body is nothing but a vessel. Now, who lives in your house? If the Holy Spirit lives in you, I can assure you of this one thing. He's going to bring that house up regardless of what community that house is in. But if you allow the enemy, meaning the spirit of the devil, to move into you, then I don't care how beautiful a home God has given you. It won't take long before the devil take that house and tear it up. And that's what Paul is saying right here. You're looking at the high priest. You're looking at these. These are supposed to be religious people. And so such were some of us. People that name the name of the Lord Jesus, but do not carry themselves in such a way that's pleasing to the Lord Jesus. And the people that standing by looking is confused because they hear us say one thing, but they see us do another thing. Is that any of you? Please say that was such. You was a such. Meaning that was you past tense. But that's no longer you today because people are watching you. Have you not read? Do you not know the word of God tells us? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. You're the house and the spirit of God dwelleth in you. So God is saying the spirit lives in you. So therefore, when the spirit of God lives and reside in your home and rules that home, I would assure you of one thing. When the spirit of God reside in your home and live there, you look different. You sound different. That's just something about you. Have you ever seen a person, although they may have a, a, a nice, maybe a beautiful person, but you can just see that they have an ugly countenance about themselves. That's because they're in turmoil and going through a lot. 
So what God is saying here, these are the priests and what they're doing. These are people that name the name of the Lord, but you can see they're up to no good because it says here again that um, that the high priest and the uh, said that the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed them against Paul. So they was the one they get they lied. They were lying and all in agreement with it. And not only that, but in verse 3, which I was more focused in on, it says, um, and they desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, lie wait in the way to kill him. So they tried to bring a sinner <laughs> into an agreement with saints to kill someone. They lied on him and then they tried to kill him. Now, with, 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 with godly people like that, who needs sinners? Who needs sinners with these kind of Christians? Or in that case, these kind of religious people. Who needs sinners? They doing a good job. The sinners sit back and like, wow, y'all can see real good, saints. So that should not be any of you guys. But Festus did not go along with that. Festus no, said, no, leave Paul, leave Paul where he be until I get there. Now, Festus did give them a chance. And that's what he was saying in verse number five. Let them therefore say he, which among you are able, go down with me to accuse this man if there be any, any um, wickedness in him. So he says, if you got an accusation against them, well, go down. Let's make the accusation. That's not a problem. Now, that's a good thing, but I'm going to show you something later on, guys. So that's what we had studied last week, and we was really getting into it. And I thank you for the patience you guys had with me last week. Sometimes I'll go back and I'll view the message, and you can see I was herky-jerky all over the place because I got off to a bad start. If you remember last week, I got off to a bad start. Again, it was... Um, um, it was my error in what I did, but it just threw everything off. When it comes to moving with the word of God, guys, one thing you need to know, the spirit of God is a still, small voice. And the spirit of God moves so smoothly that a bump or a jolt can throw everything off. And last week, I was just off base as all key. If you look at it, you'll see I was just... It's just, you know, off a bit there. But nevertheless, your prayers, thank God for his mercy and grace. We're going to get through this thing as we move forward. Now, and we move into new information in verse number six. This is what he said. Now, remember, they trying to get Festus to let them, um, to set Paul up so he could kill him. So they could kill him. In this situation, now, these are the religious people. Imagine how Festus looked at this whole situation and, and how he viewed it. Because one thing we do know that Festus knew about Jesus. That's what was taking place in Acts at the latter part of the 24th chapter. When Felix was saying Festus came and when he said certain things, Festus, when they came to the name of the Lord Jesus, Festus knew what they was talking about. Because Festus had followed this thing very, very closely. So in verse number six, as we move forward with new information, it says, And when he had tarried amongst them more than ten days, he went down unto Caesarea. And the next day, setting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought to be brought. Now, here's the situation. Festus has spent 10 days with those religious leaders and those political people. So Festus was a person, again, I tell you again, he was one in Rome. And Rome job was two things. The only thing that Rome wanted was keeping the peace and collecting the taxes. That's all Rome wanted. As they were spending the Roman Empire, they wanted to keep the peace in the province that they were in, and they wanted to collect the taxes. And so when Festus was there, he was sitting down with these leaders because this was a great uproar. This uproar just was not just happening. This has been ongoing. So this was, to me, it would have been a pretty curious thing. I just want to know, how has this fella caused this much? How many, this fella caused this many problems? What is it about this poll that have you guys all in the uproar about this? But what is it that will make these leaders lie like you're lying? Okay, I can see the political people lying because that's what political people do. But to sit and watch the religious leaders lie and draw in, in cahoots with them? Now that to me would be something of a curiosity. And that's what Festus was looking at. So again, it tells you right here, and when he had tarried amongst them more than 10 days, so we know at a minimum of 11 days, Festus spent time with them and listening at them making accusations against Paul. So he's sitting here listening at this and says, okay. Then he says he went down into Caesarea. So he went to his place and the next day sat on the judgment seat. So what he did is he went down to the place of um, Caesarea and he went to the place of authority, meaning uh, Festus was a judge, if you was. A leader, and so I got to judge this matter. Let me listen to this. Let me hear. Now, for more than 11 days, well, more than 10 days, he had heard what they had to say about Paul. 
He had heard every accusation made about Paul. He had listened at this thing carefully. And he even went to the point to say, well, guys, come with me. Come with me. I don't just want to hear what you have to say. I want to go hear what he has to say. But I also want, um, as this accusation is made, I want to be able to look to you or even look to him and say, explain. Explain. And so that's what Festus did. So he brought him. He said, now, when he got to the judgment seat, meaning when he got to Caesarea and sat in his rightful place, he commanded them, bring Paul to me. Okay, let me deal with this case right now. Let me deal with this. He says the next day. So I mean, he got to Caesarea the next day. Now, we don't know if he came in at um, later that evening, early that afternoon. We don't know. But the next day after he got himself settled in and everything, the next day he called for Paul because he wanted to deal with this matter ASAP. ASAP. And in verse 7, he says, Verse 7, it says, and when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and lied many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. <laughs> so do you see what is taking place here? So what he did is he called Paul down and then he allowed the Jews. Now, this is the way a court system is supposed to work. As I told you guys. Um, America's, our court system pretty much derived from this. Now, um, actually it was from, um, the England, um, monarchy and the way that England set up things, but theirs came from the Roman thing. That's how, in Europe, all of it is in Europe. That's how Europe set it up. Rome set it up. They had the law and a lot of things Rome were trailblazers on. And that's what they had right there. So what he's saying is this man is not guilty. Until proven innocent, he is innocent until proven guilty. And so what he said is, okay, I hear you making the accusation, but this man got to be able to speak for himself. If you just listen to anybody one side, you can always say that person sound like they're telling the truth. But when you hear another person's side of the story, you are an intelligent enough person to fill in something don't sound right here, something sound fishy. And that's why it's always good to allow a person to speak their piece, but also listen to the other side. As I often say with sports, you always have a good looking team in, scrim in um, spring practice and scrimmage. But you don't know until you scrimmage another team how well your team is. So a lie may sound good and sound like it's impenetrable until you hear the other person tell their side. And when a lie runs up against the truth, the lie usually don't hold up because there's a lot of um, contorting and twisting that a lie has to do to try to make it work. But the truth just goes forward. And so again, what he said is when he came, uh, he says, and when he, came, and when he was come, the Jews was come down from Jerusalem, stood around about and lied many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. So it doesn't matter how sensational the lie was. Can you prove it? Can you prove it? Yeah, I know what you're saying, but, but you know, you saying this, they're going to say different. How can you prove it? Now, the person that comes with proof is the one that usually everybody would look to the other and say, okay, your turn. See, one thing about, um, there's a saying goes for some people, it don't matter how well, uh, how much truth you tell a person. The saying goes, don't bother me with facts. My mind is made up. And when you see a person's mind is made up like that, there's nothing you're going to be able to tell them. Have you ever saw a person that's just saying some stuff that just, it's just stupid. What they're saying makes no sense at all. And they stick with that lie. And you look like, man, that don't, that don't even make sense. At least tell a lie that can kind of make sense. But these guys were telling things that, as the word says in the latter part, which they could not prove. So no matter what they're saying, Paul was sitting there like, okay, Okay, but okay, but what's your proof? What's your proof? They didn't even have enough sense. At least when they they came against Jesus, or, uh, or came against Jesus, they brought some false witnesses that said, "I heard him say this." At least the, the witness could have been greatly confused, but he heard him say this. But they had nobody against Paul. They just brought the accusation. And then the word says, and it says um, in verse number eight, and while he answered for himself. This is what Paul said. Now, the word is saying, Paul then began to address the situation. He said, and while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. 
So when they listen to everything that they're saying, and these are the leaders and people with all of this clout, as they listen to this, Paul listened to every last one of them, and they listened to them speak. And then Paul just said, okay, when it came time for Paul to answer, and that's what it means in verse number eight, when he answered for himself, it came time for Paul to address the matter. It says, now listen, I have not, it says, neither against the law of the Jews. So none of their laws have I broken, nor against the temple. None of the temple laws have I broken, nor yet against Caesar. None of the Roman laws have I broken, have I offended anything at all. When he said, I have not offended, I have not caused conflict according to the Jewish laws, according to the, word, the, the religious laws, nor according to the Roman laws. I have not in any way, form, or fashion caused any issues. So he's saying, if you can show me where I was against the Jewish laws, against the temple, or against the Roman laws that I have broken, um, I've done wrong, show it to me. Paul is saying, prove it. Show the people the proof. And that's why I say when there's nothing for you to hide, you don't have a problem telling it. And if you tell me to say this, uh, ask me something 30 minutes later or an hour later, I can tell you the same thing because the truth is always going to be the truth. But when the person has told a lie to one person and then another person come up and say, now, what did you tell him? And uh, you can always know a person that has been fudging on truth because they said, what did he say I said? Well, no, just tell me what he said. You don't have to know what he said, you said, because if you said the truth, no matter what he said, it's going to line up with what you tell me. And so when you have a person that always want to know before I tell you what, what I said, let me hear what he said I said, so they can find a way to get around. So that's not what you do. So Paul is saying to every last one of these, guys, you need to stand firm on the word of God, and that is the truth. You speak the truth. I have not offended the Jewish laws. I have not offended um, the temple, and I have not offended uh, Roman law. If it is, can somebody prove it to me? Somebody show the evidence, Paul is saying. Show the evidence. Now, then he says, now here's something I, uh, that caught my attention as I was studying it. It says, but Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, would thy go up to Jerusalem? And there be judge of these things before me. So Festus is saying to Paul, okay, I hear what you're saying. Now I'm going to ask you a question. If you really tell the truth, are you willing to go to Jerusalem? And these same accusations they're bringing against you, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and, and stand on these things? But here's something you need to focus in on. Focus in on the beginning part. But Festus, first part, but Festus, look at next thing. Willing to do the Jews a pleasure. Now, do you see, guys, what they're saying? Now, if you've been paying attention and study, guys, you could be able to understand what Festus was doing. See, this time, as I was beginning to read, I thought Festus was looking at this thing and was wanting to do the thing that was right by Paul. But no, Festus was not. Remember, Festus was a politician. And the politician's job was to do what? For Rome. Keep the peace. And, right, collect taxes. So this has been a big stir and an uproar again. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure. What pleasure is he willing to do the Jews? Well, go back, guys. Let's go back to verse number... Remember in verse number... Um, verse number verse number three. Look at verse number three. And, and desire... Again, verse well, 1, 2, and 3, this is what the Jews asked Festus. What did they say is, now when Festus was coming to um, verse 1, 2, and 3, it says, now when Festus was coming into the province, after, after three days, he's, he, ascended from, he, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. He says, indeed the high priest and the, and the captain of the Jews informed him against Paul, uh, besought him. So, they asked him a favor. What was the favor they asked him? And desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem. So do you see what they asked him to do? They asked him to let Paul go to Jerusalem. Where they are able to, he can have his trial there, but they was going to kill him along the way. 
And that's why I was saying, lie in wait in the way to kill him. So they asked him for that favor. Send him to Jerusalem. Send him to Jerusalem. But in verse 4, you can see Festus saying, but Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea. So that's what he said. He kept him there. But look down now in verse number 8. I'm going to say verse number 9. He says, but Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, a favor, answer Paul and said, would thy go up to Jerusalem? So Festus is saying, no, I'm not going to send him, but I'm going to ask Paul, would he go? So Festus was trying to keep his hands clean as politicians try to do. They try to, at the same time, kiss the baby and steal from you. Or if you will, they want to have both sides. I don't want to have no part with having him killed. But by the same token, I'm going to ask him, do he want to go? So if they kill him, I ain't had nothing to do with that. He chose to go. Do you see the setup that they was trying to get with Paul? So that's what was taking place. Festus already knew what their intent was. So he asked Paul, would you go up there to deal with this? But you know what they're going to do if he went to Jerusalem. So that's why it would behoove you or behoove me to pray with God and to hear the Holy Spirit and be led by the Holy Spirit. Because if we're led by the Holy Spirit, God knows exactly what to do. God tells you when you honor him, when you open your mouth, God says, I'm going to speak for you. But the problem is you have people and, and see when God's going to speak for you, the only thing God is going to speak is his word. God is going to speak his word. So Festus is in cahoots with the Jewish leaders. What he's saying is he's the political class there and the religious people. He's trying to keep the peace. And he's saying, no, I'm not finna make Paul go up to Jerusalem. But, but I will ask him if he want to go. So you got to be careful. Words mean everything. I told you, we know this at Firm Foundation. When it comes to reading and studying, that's two different things. Reading, we know that, again, Keep this in mind always, Firm Foundation. Reading is you are reading sentences. Studying, you are reading words. And we do know that when it comes to reading, you can mispronounce a word or leave a word out altogether and still get some kind of understanding of that sentence. But studying, you read that word. And when you get into the depth of that word, and know what they are really saying with that word. When you research that word and find out what it really means, you get a better understanding of what's being said there. See, because we read a word in English. Remember, the Bible was not written in English. The original um, script of the Bible was not English. It was Hebrew and Greek. And so when you study words in Hebrew and Greek, you will have a better understanding of what they are saying. It reminds me that, well, there's a certain car. Um, there's a certain car that we make here in America. Ford made this car. And the name, the name in America, it, it was clear to us what it was. It didn't, we didn't think nothing about it. It was just a nice car. But in foreign lands, it, mean, it meant cheap and trash. Who wants to name a car trash? Here, I need you to buy this trash. And so it was funny to people that was that would come over here from those lands and they say you bought you bought a trashy car but it didn't mean that here so when you know the root of a word you'll know what it uh, really what it's standing for and so what paul is saying when you begin to study and look at things festus is trying his best he's trying his best to play the end against the middle he said no i'm not trying to tell you paul to go he's saying to you will you go so he's asking, will you do it? You can solve all of this. And people do it in many ways. They butter you up. Man, you can really solve all of this. You can get to the end of this thing. All you have to do is go there. I mean, if you're speaking the truth, you go there. They're not going to be able to find anything on you. But you have to be discerning because the devil is very, very clever. Very clever. A smooth talker is one that as they're talking, they try to leave out a few things. But if you're listening, you'll know what a person is leaving out. And so that's what you have there. Again, verse number nine, but Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answer Paul and said, would thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judge of these things, of these things before, before me. So he's saying, you can go there and they can take care of it. Festus is trying to throw it all off of him, knowing that if Paul leave, they're going to kill him because that's what they said they was going to do in verse number three. That's what they said they were going to do. It says, but listen, it says, then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. 
to the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. So what he is saying to Festus is, I am right where I'm supposed to be. You know for a fact, now it evidently Fest, Paul had to know, looking at Festus, uh, listening at this, because Festus don't spend 10 days, with, more than 10 days with these people. And Festus has heard their complaint and they, the words state that they could not prove anything. And so Paul is right here speaking. So Paul is calling Festus out right now. He is calling Festus out. He said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, meaning I'm standing at your authority. Don't pass this off on anyone else. Listen, guys, when you know what to do, the word of God says to he that knoweth to do good and do it not to him, it is sin. It is sin. When you know the right thing to do and you refuse to do that right thing, God says, I hold you accountable. Why? Because to whom much is given, the word says much is required. So if you are one that God has given some information or allowed to get a hold of some information, and someone is a, 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 a tumult going on or turmoil or confusion, and you have the answer, but you won't say nothing because it's your friend. If you say something, you're going to expose. God says, I'm holding you accountable. You have to be even handed with this thing. Truth is truth, regardless of who's on the other side of it. It doesn't matter who's telling the lie. When you speak the truth, this situation, um, this situation can be resolved. Now, don't get me wrong. Every time you know truth, it's not for you to open your mouth or say anything. The law will tell you that. When it comes to our Miranda rights, you have a right to remain silent. You don't have to say anything. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that there's great turmoil going on and someone's life is at stake and you have truth and you won't say anything about it. God says, I hold you accountable. That's not the same thing as if you're sitting there and um, you see somebody break a, a glass and they're trying to find out who broke the glass and you don't say nothing. That's a totally different thing. Then somebody, they got a person's life at stake and you know what truth is. And you refuse to say anything. God says, I'm going to hold you accountable because you now accessory to what's going on. So saints, what it is when you stand with God, you got to stand for the truth. The world needs to know. Your job needs to know. Your home needs to know that you, when you speak, you're going to tell the truth. You're going to be truthful. So this is what he's saying. Paul is saying, Fest, um, he's saying to Festus, you know this. You are the seat of Caesar, meaning I'm standing before the righteous judgment seat that I should be at. And you know they are lying. You know it. He says, which I ought to be judged. So it's not you pass it off to them. You know you are the one that has to do this responsibility. He says, um, judge, to the Jews I have done no wrong as thou well knowest. So he said, you know it. The evidence has spoken. So you know I have not done nothing wrong. You know that they are lying. You know that I'm in a rightful place. So why don't you want to do your duty? Why don't you want to do your duty? Keeping that peace so that a person is killed or your friend committed a crime but they finna send a person to prison for life and you know it was your friend that did this God says I'm gonna hold you accountable I'm gonna hold you accountable I'm not saying it's easy I'm not saying it's easy even well I'm not saying it's easy but God commands us to do the right thing remember his law don't be deceived God is not marked for what you sow is what you will also reap. If you was in a state where someone had um, the evidence that can clear you, you will want them to come forth. Well, why won't you? Who is God talking to? Who are you? Who are you that you have this information and will not give it? God is, how in the world do you not know that God will bring you here and then ask you, to do this thing, do the right thing. Even though you may lose a friend, you will not lose the Lord. He will be on your side. I pray for you that you are able to do that right thing because it's not right that somebody innocent should have to pay for the wrongdoings of the wicked. And so that's what Paul was saying right there. That's what he was saying. You know this. I know it sucks that you have this responsibility, but you know this. And then he says, for if I be, he says, if I be an offender or have committed anything 
worthy of death. I refuse not to die. So Paul is saying, if I did wrong, I will take the responsibility for what I have done wrong. I will stand up. If I did it, yes, I ought to be punished for it. I have no problem being punished for what I've done wrong. See, you have people that will do a thing and don't want no responsibility for the thing that they do. They don't want no accountability for what they do wrong. So Paul is saying, for if I be if I be an offender and have committed and committed anything worthy of death, I, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of those things whereof they accuse me, no man deliver no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. So what he is saying is Paul is looking at this situation. Festus have the information. He know Paul is telling the truth. He knows that they are lying. But Festus is trying to weasel his way out of this thing so that he don't have to take on the responsibility of the crowd may go into an uproar. Listen, if you are a leader, God put you in the front for a reason. Now you may say I'm not a leader, but you are. If you are a believer in Christ, you are a leader. Because what God is going to do is that somewhere it's going to come to a situation to where you're going to have to make a call. Or you're going to have to stand up for something. And people are going to be watching you. It's time for you to lead. If you're a believer, God has already put the leadership skill in you. And so with that said, when you come up to that, what you're going to have to do is then learn to stand firm on God's word. Know your rights and stand within them. See, this is what Paul is saying. He has already said, if I've done wrong, and is supposed to die, okay, I'm, I'm willing to die. Wrong is wrong. How it goes, if you do the crime, you do the time. And so Paul said, if I did the crime, I'll do the time. But I have not done anything. But I also see that you, um, Festus, is not going to do your rightful thing. I see right now you're not going to step in your rightful place because you have been bullied by these leaders. So he's saying what I'm going to do in that situation is I'm going to appeal to Caesar. Let me take it to a higher. Let me take it to a higher. Let me take it to a higher court. So he said, let me take it to a higher court here. And that's what he is pointing to. He said, I'm appeal to a higher source. Since you won't do your job, let me take it up. Let me take it up a level. See, because Paul has been held in jail for a long time. And you know that they're lying. Festus knew, uh, Felix knew that they was lying. Festus, you know that they're lying. But neither one of them released Paul. He is still in jail. And because we read a verse until the next verse, guys, again, there can be months between those verses. There can be months between those verses. So the only thing that I'm saying to you is this. Guys. When we have gone to in verse number 11, I need you all to do me a favor. I need you to honor God and obey God's word. I'm not saying it's not going to be scary, but what I am saying is God loves you. He will not put more on you than you can handle. Now, I don't care what it is. It may be a hard thing to do, but take a moment, set aside, and pray for strength, and then go forward. Yes, your boss may get mad at you. Please, do not co-sign on some shady things that is going on on a job. If they're fudging numbers, don't have your hand, no part of it. Make sure they understand you are not to be anywhere around when they do these things because if it ever comes to you, you are going to take and speak truth. Saints, whoever this is for, please hold firm. Do your job. Trust God with the rest. And I promise you, God is never, ever, ever going to leave you alone. Oh, Father, we thank you for the time that we have had in your word tonight. I pray that you bless the saints of God, that they may take the word of God and apply it to their lives. Oh, Lord, be merciful to each and every last one of us that we may grow in your law, word, will, and way. Help us to stay humble before you that we may continue to look to you, Lord, that you may guide us along the way. And do not let your word slip from our heart. Oh, Lord, but I pray for strength for whosoever you were speaking to that may have that responsibility that's lying on their shoulders to speak the truth, even if it may cause conflict. Let them speak the truth, Lord, in love. And Lord, protect them and back them, that the truth may come forward. 
that they may be known of people of character. For our walk and our relationship with you trumps anything, Lord God, we have on our job or with a friend. Help us that we may grow in your word. Help us that we may stay in your will, abide in your laws, and walk in your way. For doing this, Lord, we'll be so careful to give your name to praise. For this is a prayer that we ask the Holy Spirit to deliver to the Father. For it is both in the name and under the blood of our Lord and our Savior. For you are Jesus. You are the Christ. If you're in agreement with that prayer, saints, say amen. Now let me ask, is there anyone out here who do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and would like to know him as your Lord and Savior? If you are one who do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and want to stand on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ to be a part of the family of Almighty God, if you're willing to do that, I want to walk you through God's plan of salvation. But before we take another step, let me ask, are you one that once knew him? You love the Lord with all your heart, strength, soul, and might. You accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you ran on, but somewhere it burned out of you. Someone talked it out of you. You turned your back and walked away from the Lord, and you now want to get back in line with God's word. Well, if you're that person, I have good news for you. God is calling you. I want to walk you through God's plan of rededication. Come, walk with me with the person that never knew Jesus and the person that once knew him and turned and walked away. Just repeat, say, Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this door that is open before me. I take full advantage of the opportunity and the door that is set before me and walk through it by asking you, Jesus, forgive me for the life of sin that I have been living. Forgive me, Lord, for living your life my way. I, Lord, right now, repent of that lifestyle. Repent of the way I have been thinking. Repent of the way I have been speaking. And I ask you, Lord, to cleanse my thoughts. Cleanse my words. Cleanse my mind. Oh, Father, I ask you now, Jesus, to come into my life. Sit on the throne of my heart. I, Lord, by my own free will, accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and confess Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for sitting on the throne of my heart. I yield my will to yours. Thank you, Father, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you have prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of Almighty God. Welcome home. We missed you. Now, if you have uh, made that commitment, be it that you have just given your life to Christ or you are one that um, have rededicated your life to Christ, put it in the comment section. Let us know that we may be able, you know, to be able to celebrate with you. Hey, if you are one to say, okay, now that I'm saved, I'm giving my life to Christ, what do I do now, preacher? Get in a good Bible-believing church, sit down and learn the Word of God. You may be confused about what is a good Bible-believing church. I, I'm not sure about that. Okay, just stay with us then. Stay here with us. And we will continue teaching the Word of God. And as you grow and get stronger, and trust God, you will branch out to be a part of a local body of believers where you are able to minister, be ministered to and to be able to hear the Word of God and apply it to your life that you can do some ministry. So you may say, well, I want to come and visit you guys. Where are you located? We're located at... 1851 Highway 66 South in the city of Kernersville in the state of North Carolina. You may say, yes, I want to come and visit the saints that I may spend time with you guys. Um, shake hands, give a hug, and to be able to just fellowship with the saints. We would love to see you. Guys, here's one thing about it. If you want to come and visit us, we have Sunday morning worship where we start at 9 a.m. for Christian education. So with Christian education, we have that, guys. It's Bible study. You can sit down. Uh, well, um, Sunday school, if you will. We sit down. You can talk. Um, back and forth, um, deposit information, take in information, and then follow that 10 a.m. hour um, Sunday morning worship service. I would love to see you there. We would love to see you there. And then we have, of course, Wednesday night Bible study. Looking forward to see you, seeing you on either one of these channels. Now, you may say, how do I support the ministry? Well, you can go to firmfoundationoutreach.org right here where you're at, guys. And you can then, there's a QR code where you are able to give. We thank you so much for the time that we have had together in the Word. We thank you for the time that you spend with us. We look forward to seeing you right here on this page, right here on this channel, 
Wednesday nights, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. You be blessed in the name of our Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. Look forward to seeing you.